Motoring 2010 on TSN is brought to you by Quaker State, Real Durable Oil, and Michelin, a better way forward. You know, if you're a Japanese car maker, life for the most part has been pretty good, and here's why. Since the year 2000, the Japanese share of the auto market in the United States has gone from 26% to 40% in 2009. Not bad. But not everybody is happy. Suzuki and Mitsubishi have seen business dip sharply. In fact, in the States, Mitsubishi is down 46%. It used to own 2% of the market, which was good for them, but now it's sitting at around 0.5. Here in Canada, it's still less than 2% of the market share, but at least it has been increasing. Now, every company will tell you it's all about product, and that has been Mitsubishi's problem. Sort of. This company is making some real good vehicles. I can attest to that. But how many people do you know that own one? And therein lies the dichotomy. So a company like Mitsubishi, every new vehicle could be a lifesaver. And so with that in mind, we find ourselves out here on a frozen lake just outside Quebec City to check out a vehicle that has done very well for this company. It now has a brand new look, and they call it the Outlander. In the industry, they consider this a facelift. Uh, however, as you can see from the vehicle today, there's a lot of change that has occurred. The entire front end of the vehicle is redesigned for 2010. However, it goes beyond the metal. We have a new SAWC system, which we've added to the Outlander XLS, and it's uh, similar in its philosophy to uh, what we introduced on the Lancer Revolution. With a, a normal four-wheel drive system, you've got torque vectoring from front to rear. Uh, the big difference with the SAWC system is you have torque vectoring from left to right now. Uh, usually with four-wheel drive system, if you get stuck in the snow, uh, the power wants to go to the path of least resistance. So if you've got a spinning wheel, it's just going to go all directly to there with the new active front differential it will shift the power from that wheel that's slipping over to the side that has grip and it'll get you out of that situation. Uh, we had a great opportunity to drive the Outlander today on the ice, which was fantastic. Their new all-wheel drive system with an active front differential. I found that a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity to be in this kind of setting. It doesn't happen every day, and it gave us the opportunity to see what the system actually does, and it was very impressive. They're definitely worth the money, but I'm not sure that the average consumer is going to be able to differentiate between the type of system. It's the end result that counts, not sort of how it works. A few weeks ago, we were checking out Acura and looking at its decision to go with a common front end on all their vehicles. It does seem to be a trend among auto manufacturers, including Mitsubishi. I mean, the front end of this Outlander has been completely redesigned, and that includes the addition of the so-called shark nose grille. We want to try and have more of a cohesive appearance with the lineup. Uh, we introduced the, uh, the shark front end, as, as many have called it, uh, on the Lancer, and then of course it was introduced on the Lancer Evolution. And now we're adding it to the Outlander, and you'll see it on uh, future Mitsubishi as well. One more comment on front ends. Some designer somewhere, whether with Mitsubishi, Acura, Audi, or whatever, has spent a lot of time designing front ends like this one, which I like. And then you come along and you put, in most states and in most provinces, a front license plate on the nose. So much for design. Am I the only one that doesn't understand the purpose of a front license plate? In terms of lineup, we'd be uh, looking at an ES, which is our four-cylinder, and then we have an LS model, which is the uh, introduction into the V6. 230 horsepower, so it's up 10 horsepower since last year, but we've actually improved the fuel consumption at the same time. I think it's essential in this segment. A lot of the competition has four cylinders. The V6 is, is important. It, it's got a lot more torque, it's got a lot more power, which is great for on-highway situations. 
couple of interesting things about the new Outlander. It comes with hill start descent, which means if you're on a hill at a light, it allows you a couple of seconds to take your foot off the brake and accelerate without the vehicle rolling back or stalling. They also have idle neutral. So once again, you're at a light, your foot is on the brake, you're in drive. Well, after two seconds of depressing the brake, the transmission will switch into neutral. The theory is you're saving fuel because there's less stress on the engine. Not exactly auto stop, but it certainly is the next best thing. Every time they bring out a new car, they're taking another giant step forward. They've been coming from behind for years. They've had difficulty in North America because our tastes are a bit different. Now we're starting to see more Americanized vehicles. The new Outlander is a prime example. This is a car that will make anybody feel safe. They can drive it down the roads 99% of the year and not have a problem. It's a huge step forward. I think it's tough at, at this end of the market. They're, they're, um, they have to fight competition from Korea with Kia and Hyundai. We're making, you know, arguably good cars. Um, but I, you know, this this car looks much better to me than than anything from Korea, to be honest. Just getting the name out there and getting people to know Mitsubishi, and once they do get in the vehicle, they realize that it's an excellent product. When safety systems turn on you, no, it's not Dr. Phil. That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. Coupe with a K, as my friend Jim Kenzie says, donnez-moi un break. On this edition of Test Drive, the Kia Forte Coupe. As with the Kia Forte sedan, the new coupe comes in two distinctly different flavours. The base EX is an about town runabout that's all about style and comfort. The up level SX is a delightful ride that keys on the sportier side of life. The biggest difference between the two versions, well it's found in the motive power. The EX employs a lively 2 litre 4 that churns out 156 horsepower. The SX ups the ante with a larger 2.4 litre 4 cylinder engine. This engine puts 173 horsepower and 168 pound feet of torque at the driver's disposal, and it brings a much broader power band. Not only is the urgency of the drive cranked up, the engine is noticeably smoother and so much faster to respond to throttle input. The engine choices in this Kia Coupe are interesting. If you take the base engine, the two liter and add cam timing to the exhaust side and add a turbocharger, well you end up with a Genesis Coupe engine. It pushes 210 horsepower. This engine, well this 2.4 liter, if you add a turbo to it, you end up with a Caliber SRT4 engine it pushed 285 horsepower. It doesn't take much imagination to figure out which way Kia could be heading. The 2.4 litre engine is offered with a 6-speed manual box or optional 5-speed automatic with Kia's Sportmatic manual mode. The manual is barely passable. The manumatic on the other hand, well it delivers a better drive altogether. It shifts gears smoothly and it is but a snappy downshift away from the heart of the engine's power band. Not so long ago, if you bought an entry-level car, that's exactly what you got. Plastic seats, plastic floor mats, and not much of anything else. Well, this Kia Coupe for an entry-level car comes with a ton of stuff. It starts with heated power leather seats, power moonroof, the usual power locks, windows, mirrors, and cruise control. You also get some nice stuff tilt and telescopic steering wheel adjustment, standard Bluetooth, which is becoming an increasingly more important feature, and a decent radio that comes with both USB and iPod inputs. It all comes together in a manner that's closer to being near luxury than entry level. The ride and handling characteristics are equally different. The EX's suspension is best described as comfortably compliant. Moving up to the SX brings a much sportier suspension. It beefs up the spring and damper rates, which all but eliminates body roll. It has a much sharper steering response, and thanks to the 215-45R17 tires, much less understeer at the limit. 
Unlike so many two-door cars, this Forte Coupe will actually accommodate two adults. As long as the front seats aren't all the way rearward, there's decent knee room, and because the sunroof opens outside the car, you've actually got half decent headroom. As for the trunk, 12.6 cubic feet, and of course, 60-40 split folding rear seats. On the safety front, the Kia Coupe arrives with six airbags, active front headrests, strong four-wheel disc brakes with anti-lock, and electronic stability and traction control systems, all as standard equipment. There are very few cars at this end of the price ladder that come so well equipped, so chalk up another compelling reason to take a serious look at the Coupe. If you're in the market for an affordable set of wheels that's a real blast to drive and you don't necessarily need to use the back seat full time, this Kia Forte Coupe, it should be on your shopping list. Michelin, a better way forward. Electric Avenue featuring the vehicles of tomorrow was a big hit at this year's Detroit Auto Show. The choices of yesterday are not the good choices of tomorrow. It was the perfect place for Michelin to let consumers know that with the right tires, you can cut down on emissions and save fuel today. If you look at the total quantity of oil, which is being used for road transportation, it's 45% of the total oil which is being extracted in the world. 9% of the total oil extracted in the world, which is tire related. It represents 8 million barrels of oil every day. So if we can save 10% of that, 20% of that, which we can do, this is a fantastic contribution to energy supply and to the reduction of CO2 at a very, very minimal investment. And this is exactly what we've been concentrating on with Green X tires, which really focus on safety and, and, and fuel efficiency. This is really a, a good way for the consumer, you know, to think that by resorting to the right choice of tires, it can make a tremendous contribution to energy supply security and at the same time to uh, the safety of uh, his or her family. Make sure you check out the Motoring website at motoringtv.com. You can watch any program you may have missed. In fact, how about a trip down memory lane and see what we were driving as far back as 1988. Check out our blog, our photo gallery, and much more. It's all there at motoringtv.com. Now I just put it in reverse and this is the weird part, I never get used to it. You take your foot off the brake, you're only using the accelerator and brake and the car as you can see is doing it itself. I'm just adding a little brake, it's really weird. Again hands off, just using the brake, back in reverse, keep going back, back into drive. Done. You know, when I was younger, I loved winter. Loved to ski, loved to play hockey outside. But that was then. Now I'm older, much older, and I just don't get it. I mean, on a winter shoot like this, it takes me about an hour in the morning to put all this stuff on. I'm exhausted before I go out, and then I gotta do it all over again at the end of the day. And I blame our ancestors for this. I mean, they come over here, I guess they didn't notice the black flies in the summer and the frozen lakes in the winter. Did they never Ever hear of California dreaming? Well, the good thing about whiners like me, we've got warm clothing to put on, unlike our vehicles. So with that in mind, let's join our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Hey Brad, we just came off the coldest night so far this winter. 
And it's not bad out here right now, it's calm, no wind, but it's still darn cold. Now what happens to your car truck when you come out on that really cold morning, you know, you're just kind of cringing and holding your breath, hoping that that thing's going to start. Sometimes you close your eyes when you turn that key and just hope she's going to go. You know, well, let's start off talking about the battery, for example. What happens to that battery on a really cold morning? Well, think about these new cars now. I mean, you hit the key fob to, to unlock the doors. Many new cars now turn the headlights on before you've even got in the car. So they're pulling battery power with the headlight system right there. You open the door, the interior lights come on. You've got parasitic drains off the battery for the engine management system, body control modules, etc., all drawing a little bit of power from that battery. But you know what? You've got to make sure that you've got the right lubricants in these vehicles. Make sure you've got the right grade of motor oil. Does your car call for 530? Maybe it calls for 5W20 or synthetic motor oil is even better if you're in sub-zero temperatures. Make sure you've got the right motor oil in there and make sure it hasn't been in the crankcase for an extended period of time. If you've got oil in that engine that was in there last summer, it's thickened. It's, it's thickened up just way too much to give you the proper protection that you need on a cold start. And you will hear many engines when you cold start them a morning like this morning, you get three or four or five seconds of lifter noise out of that engine or you hear some mechanical noise out of that engine and it goes quiet a couple of seconds later. That's telling you that your boundary lubrication was not good. In other words, the oil is not getting to all the extremities of the engine. Oil pressure is not reaching there quick enough to keep it quiet. It's telling you that, so you want to think about changing that oil, upgrading to a synthetic and changing it on a regular basis. Now, the best and simplest way to warm up an engine on a really cold morning is with an engine block heater. And you'd be surprised how many vehicles intended for sale in Canada come factory equipped with a block heater and the owners of the vehicles in many cases don't even know it. Now if you live in western Canada, you know all about block heaters because in many cases you're not going to get the car going without them. Simple little element like this, the block heater element goes into the engine block down there and that cord stretches from the engine block right up to the grill here. You plug it into 110. Don't overdo it. You only need a few hours to warm that thing up. I used mine this morning on the truck for about an hour and a half and it fired up really fast and the engine sounded perfect and this thing hadn't ran in weeks so it just shows you how well they work. And it's a very inexpensive little item. If you don't already have one you can have a mechanic retrofit it. You know what? I picked up a block heater at the uh, auto parts store today for this chute. Interesting thing, I looked on the packaging. It's made in Canada. There's actually an auto part that's still made here in Canada, not China. Surprise, surprise. And oh yeah, guess where it's made? Winnipeg, Manitoba, the block heater capital of Canada. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2010. Well, we hope you love your first look at the production version of the all-new Honda CRZ as much as we do. This is the global debut of a global car, and we're very excited to be able to bring it to our customers here in the U.S. For those of you who weren't around for the CRX, the CRX was originally introduced in the U.S. as a high fuel efficiency vehicle. However, with time, it's stylish, fun nature arguably played a huge role in the birth of the tuner market. What better way to kick off the year than with the debut of this stylish and fun new CRZ, which will join the Civic Hybrid and Insight as the third vehicle in our hybrid lineup. Now, I know you've heard plans from other manufacturers about bringing products and offering products in this new segment, but this is a real car and it's coming to you in just a few months. Closed captioning of Motoring 2010 is brought to you by the most fuel-efficient crossover on the highway, the all-new Chevy Equinox. When daytime running lights were made mandatory in Canada back around the end of the last ice age, I thought, this is a great idea. Now, I've always run with my headlights on all the time, 
because frankly, it makes you more visible to other drivers, not that you necessarily want to be a target. Now, the regulation requires only that front lights be on, and most manufacturers now utilize 85% intensity high beams. And the reason for that is high beams aren't used as often, and it reduces the frequency of the bulbs burning out. Fair enough. The biggest problem with DRL, other than the fact that it doesn't show the rear lights, is that a lot of car makers also turn on the instrument lights when the DRL is on. So if you're driving at night, particularly in the rain, you can see the glow of your headlights in front of you, your instrument lights are on, you have no clue that your taillights aren't on. And if somebody's coming up from behind you, particularly again in rain or fog, that's a very dangerous situation. Now, do you know what your DRL system in your car does? Some cars only put the front lights on and no instrumentation. That's like my Volkswagen does. Some cars run all headlights all the time, which is the way it really should be. If you don't put your headlights on, the car will for you. I think Volvo does that. You, as a motoring viewer, probably follow my advice, I hope, and always run with your headlights on. But tell all your friends, particularly maybe your elder relatives who may be driving a Toyota or a Nissan, mom, dad, uncle, switch the lights on, turn them all the way on. There might be an automatic setting, a lot of cars have that now. Don't count on that, click them all the way on. Then you got your high beams, your low beams when you need to. When you get out of the car, there's a little warning buzzer to tell you to turn the lights off so you don't forget and run your battery down. That used to be a problem with running your headlights on all the time. But what Transport Canada really has to do, and I know I've mentioned this before, They've got to tell car makers, you can't run DRL and instrument lights on. Remember, light your way, not only for you, but for the guy behind you. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, Mitsubishi knew what it had to do in this tough segment when it brought out the new Outlander, and I think they have pulled it off. From a design point of view, I love the front end. The interior, much improved, actually feels like a luxury vehicle. And you have a choice of a four or a six cylinder, something not all the competition has. And looking to the future, a new product, apparently Mitsubishi has a small crossover coming out based on the Lancer platform, and after that, possibly a global vehicle. So yes, Mitsubishi is here to stay. Before we go, don't forget, upcoming is our one our car of the year special so go to motoringtv.com and you can vote on our nominees and then on our special we'll announce your winners and ours that's it for now we'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. the environmentalists the eco weenies the whole group has said Oh, big bad auto industry, they're stopping the mass public from making a transformation into the, you know, environmentally conscious automobile. It's all their fault that people don't have a product to buy. There's a pent up demand for this. Well, there's no more freaking excuses. Motoring 2010 on TSN has been brought to you by Quaker State, Real Durable Oil, and Michelin, a better way forward.